At the time I'm making this video, it is currently 34 degrees Celsius or 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit outside. For context, the city I live in, Prague, Czech Republic, is on the same latitude as Vancouver, Canada and the average July temperature is roughly 18 to 19 degrees Celsius or 64 to 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Before any residents of the deep friars that are Texas or Arizona or others come out in the comments section, our houses aren't built for this and most residential buildings don't have AC so we can't escape the heat. So in today's video we'll take a look at how urban planning and architecture could mitigate the effects of heat waves and global warming. Before the video starts please consider subscribing, it's free and it helps out a lot. Thanks and on to the video. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, the urban heat island effect occurs when cities replace natural land cover with dense concentrations of pavement, buildings and other surfaces that absorb and retain heat. In simpler terms, when a city is covered in asphalt and concrete with insufficient green space, it traps heat and temperatures rise substantially. Completed with streets lined with parked cars and waste heat generated from AC units, car engines, among others, a lot of modern cities make for incredible heat islands. This effect means that streets and stuff on them, like people or cars, can get unbearably hot, sometimes reaching temperatures like 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The urban heat island effect is also partially responsible for why it is so dangerous to leave your children or pets in parked cars during the summer. When a car is sitting in an asphalt desert with the sun beating down on it, it gets hot, deadly hot, as in 950 dead children from heat stroke by being left in a car in the US since 1998 hot. Now that we've established what the urban heat island effect is, let's look at potential solutions to mitigate it and potential solutions for a greener, more sustainable city. When you hear the phrase sustainable transport, what do you usually think of? It's usually shiny CGI renderings of a solar punk city with electric self-driving cars whizzing through it, right? Well, electric cars won't save us, they aren't the solution. This has been said many times before, so I'll keep it short. EVs won't save us because they're still cars, they waste a ton of space and making the heavy batteries is incredibly damaging for the environment. When I imagine sustainable transport, I imagine something like this a tram or another form of public transport running through a canopy of trees and greenery. In my opinion, this is real sustainable transport. The trees and vegetation provide protection from the heat or rain or other types of unpleasant weather and the tram moves way more people than cars ever could and it's electric too. We achieved all of that without having to dig up all of Chile for lithium and without having to dig up the whole of the Democratic Republic of the Congo for cobalt. At public transit stops, my idea of sustainable cities is this, dense, walkable development with trees and other greenery. This development pattern has been tried and tested for thousands of years, since ancient times to roughly the end of World War II. This development pattern is good for the environment because of lower carbon emissions and for people's health because walking reduces the risk of obesity, heart disease, among others. Another form of sustainable transport is our old friend, the bicycle. With proper infrastructure, some vegetation and tree cover, cycling can be viable even in warmer climates. As a case study, let's look at the city of Sevilla in Spain. Spain is known as a popular vacation destination, in part because of its warm climate. Summers tend to get very hot, even though the temperature may not suggest that cycling would be a viable solution for transport, the city of Sevilla proves this theory wrong. Originally, for $32 million and 5,000 parking spaces, the city built roughly 80 kilometers or 50 miles of dedicated cycle tracks. This is continuously being expanded to this day. Today, the network has 180 kilometers or 111 miles of cycle tracks. Roughly 70,000 trips were made by bike in Sevilla in 2019, taking a 6% share of all trips in the city. Of course, cycling isn't a catch-all solution for transit, but it is definitely a viable method of transport in the urban transport mix. For this part, we have to revisit our old friend, the contemporary American suburb. A lot of American suburban houses are made on an almost assembly line basis. To do so, construction companies usually build the frame with wood and then build the rest with plaster, drywall or other somewhat flimsy material. These houses are also fully detached, meaning that heat, or in this case cold, dissipates from all four sides of the building. 
In contrast, a townhouse, which is usually surrounded by other houses to its left and right, performs better in this regard. Since heat and cold can only dissipate from its front and back, heating and cooling costs are considerably lower. Another problem with a lot of US suburban houses is insulation. Drywall, plaster and other similar materials are about as good as keeping the summer heat out as Elon Musk is at revolutionizing transport. Another massive source of carbon emissions is the pride and joy of every suburban dad, the monoculture lawn, made of grass and exactly nothing else. These green rectangles of grass may look nice, but keeping them that way, especially in a hot climate like in Texas or Florida, uses a lot of water. It uses roughly 500 liters of water per 100 square meters, or 125 gallons per 1000 square feet of lawn per hot summer day, according to Lowe's, a big hobbyist store in the US. For a sense of scale, a single tennis court is roughly 2000 square feet large, meaning that half of that is roughly 1000 square feet. Do keep in mind that this is the overall usage, which includes rainwater, but in hot, dry places like Arizona, the vast majority of that water will have to come from manual watering. According to HomeAdvisor.com, the average Arizona lawn is 605 square meters, or 6,513 square feet large. The state is pretty much a desert, so rainfall is pretty low, at 12.26 inches of rain per year. Using this handy rainfall calculator, link in the description, we can calculate the amount of water that rains on our average Arizona lawn each year. The lawn gets hit by roughly 50,000 gallons of rainwater per year, lasting for roughly 61 days of watering. The rest has to be drawn from underground aquifers, which are running out, or from something like the Colorado River, which is drying up due to water overconsumption, droughts, among other reasons. For comparison, a more temperate place like Virginia gets about 44 inches of rain per year. This could water our lawn for 220 hot days, which occur far less frequently here than in Arizona, and the rest could be sustained with river or lake water. The carbon emissions used to keep the lawn tidy, with stuff like gas-powered lawn mowers and runoff from military-grade chemicals used to keep the lawn free of pests, among others, won't help in the future as well. The city of Las Vegas, located in the middle of a desert, recently outlawed lawns to conserve water. This is probably the only sane decision that came out of that city, probably ever. Apart from the carbon emissions, potent chemical usage and water wasting, monoculture lawns are also catastrophic for biodiversity. With frequent cutting, the roots of the grass become weaker, which will require you to fertilize the plant more frequently. Chemical use and monocultural growth patterns cause pollinators like bees and insects to have nothing to pollinate and no habitats. Some people have decided to ditch the manicured grass lawn in favor of more natural gardens. They have planted native species of plants and let their grass grow, which results in lower carbon emissions and better biodiversity. An escape from the heat could be found in non-drywall-based architecture. For examples of heat-resistant architecture, we can look at Mediterranean countries like Greece, Italy or Spain. The Mediterranean gets hot during the summer and has been getting hot every summer for millennia, so the locals had to come up with some ingenious ways of keeping their houses cool. So, for example, let's look at the Aegean Islands in Greece. Buildings usually use very light paint due to its sun-reflecting properties. These houses are also very well insulated and have thick walls to keep the cool air in and the hot air out. Windows are usually on the smaller side and are oriented north because the north side captures the least sunlight and by extension the least heat. Paving is kept to a minimum and light colored tiles are used where possible, again to maximize sunlight reflection. This paving style can be most prominently found in the narrow streets of the inner parts of local towns and cities. Streets are designed in such a way to allow wind to pass through freely by making them narrow, mostly straight and having the streets surrounded by mid-rise buildings, cooling it down. Towns also use plants, trees and other vegetation to cool down the air around them. For another source of inspiration, we can look to the Islamic world, both old and new. For older examples, this is the wind catcher. Does exactly what it says, it catches flowing wind and directs it into a building, cooling it down. Cool air from the wind is pushed in through one side of the structure and hot air is pushed out on the other side. These ingenious buildings have been used for millennia in the Middle East, North Africa and Central Asia. For a newer example of a piece of heat-resistant architecture, the country of Qatar has recently painted some of their roads in blue instead of keeping them in the normal black color. 
This is supposed to reduce the amount of absorbed heat because the lighter color reflects more sunlight instead of absorbing it. I am not a particular fan of Qatari urban planning, it's way too car dependent for my taste, but this blue road is a nice idea in my opinion. In conclusion, climate change is happening, the planet is getting hotter and cities need to adapt before they turn into massive frying pans for the summer months. Thank you so so much for watching to the end, this has been Tramley and I'll see you next week, bye!